Hi, I'm Stephen, this is Mick, and today we're going to be talking about language. Before we begin though, we just want to say that this is only a discussion. There are no right or wrong answers. These are just our thoughts and opinions which can and will change. Neither of us are experts on anything. We are just two dudes talking. Our discussion, sorry, discussion on language today. I wanted to talk about, first off, what the impetus for this uh, topic is. It's very broad language. We'll see where we go with this. We may even touch on various things that we wouldn't have even imagined. But in order to keep it kind of focused, at least to begin with, I want to talk about, okay, why did we choose this topic? And the main reason for choosing this topic was that there's a lot of talk around changing the meaning of words today. And some people are very comfortable with that, feel like it's a progressive, good things to do. Whereas me and a lot of other people out there are probably a little bit more hesitant looking at it. Hang on, do we actually understand what the purpose of language is? And do we understand the unintended consequences of changing language and the, the definitions of words? So there's something I want to put to you first. I want to make an assertion and then I want to get your take on it to see if you agree with it. Because I think if we both agree on this, at least that's kind of like the foundation of, okay, we can build up from there. So my assertion is the purpose of language is to accurately communicate a message between two or more parties. Yeah, I think the goal is to try and accurately communicate the message. Yep, <clears throat> 100%. Yeah. So added on to that is the content of the message is actually irrelevant. doesn't matter what we're trying to send. Just the point is that whatever I say or whatever the, the sender says is what the receiver receives that there's no noise in between it, that the signals are, uh, that, that the transmission, the communication is, we're sending out and receiving the same message. However we interpret, however we feel about that message, that's a completely different matter. Just the purpose of language itself is just to communicate that message without any noise, without any lack of uh, integrity, I guess. Yeah, 100% true. <clears throat> but I would say that you have to interpret at either end too. So the message is... Uh, yeah, so I guess the message is the the content that you're giving to someone else, but then there's uh, for that person to consume that content, there's an interpretation. Yeah, and that's where there there's a little bit of discussion of, or it gets a little bit fuzzy. What is the difference between the communication medium and how someone understands a message? Because there's a difference there. You know, we may disagree on something, but we may have understood each other's perspectives completely so that's completely fair but for the message itself to be like i say something and you interpret it as meaning something else that itself is the issue here and that's what i want to resolve yeah i think that that's where <clears throat> the room of uh where it gets a little bit messy i guess so it, I, I, what, what's interesting the way you're breaking up i think automatically of like a communication system like a network system and so ideally your ma your messages are, are standardized and static in the way in which they're described but humans are a little bit messier than that because uh obviously a computer you can be explicit about exactly what's what whereas humans it's hard to actually you know explicitly change their mind to come up with that same interpretation that a, that a like a computer system would do. Yeah, and the content of that message is more subjective as well. In a computer system, you're using logic, you're using mathematics. So the data itself is very objective. So as long as, like we said, the you the, send, the receiver gets the exact same message that the sender put out, it's likely the receiver is going to understand and interpret it exactly the same way as the sender, the sender um, wanted them to. But for language, it's a little bit different. Like words are subjective we and and by that i mean like think about it this way the words that we use most of them don't have anything tangible that you can point to and say that is what that word is even if you think of like a table okay i point to this and i say this is a table yeah it is but what makes it a table like answer that oh you can put stuff on it, it has four legs does a table have to have four legs does a table have to be, you put something on it? What if it's like some abstract table that you just can't use? Like there, there is, the language we use itself is, is a bit more tricky. So as well as the message coming across clearly, also we have to think about when we're putting together that message that the other person will most likely understand it in the way that we intended. 
Yeah, that's correct. And I think, uh, yeah, that is the the ideal purpose of, of language is to basically for us to agree upon, uh, I guess, a set of definitions that allows us to communicate uh, uh, our story or our experience in a way that the other person can then interpret it as close as closely as we we uh, uh, we, we present it, I guess. Um, so, yeah. All right. So I've thought through this, but I want to see your perspective on it. What do you think if we were to change, say, the definition of a word or two or three or whatever, however many, what are kind of the impacts that you see that having on our ability to communicate, our ability to do the objective of language, which is to accurately communicate a message? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. From my point of view, <clears throat> I don't actually, I don't think I have, I sit on one side or the other, whether you change it or not, but I think it's in, it's important to understand what a change will actually do. And I guess a change opens up a situation where things can be misinterpreted and the more changes that happen, uh, the more uh, something can be misinterpreted greater, I guess. Um, so <clears throat> if I go back to... Uh, um, and maybe in this early stage of this podcast, I'll sort of refer to like an, a computing system or an IT system because I think it's similar. So you can imagine as a communication protocol gets upgraded over a period of time, um, it, a good portion of that message might be fine, even though the system has updated and there's been extra functionality added or, or whatever. But then at some point in time, a particular version of, of a communication protocol will break uh, because a certain uh, foundational meaning might change and therefore the system doesn't understand the change that's actually occurred and you'd have to upgrade that protocol. So it's similar to me in those uh, when we change definitions, I guess, of, of certain words. So I guess some are going to have a more critical impact than others, but at the end of the day, it just opens each change we do opens up the challenge, uh, opens up the opportunity for be things being misinterpreted if uh, people aren't up to date, I guess. That's very similar to how I see it. And I also, as you can imagine, picture it in terms of a computer system and software. And I think it is fair to do that. Like a lot of people, there's always that question, are we living in a simulation? Like, But I, I like to invert it and think, no, we created, or sorry, we tend to think of it in the terms of, are we created in the image of a machine when, or a computer? When I like to think of it, no, actually the computer or machine is created in the image of humans. The way a computer is constructed, is put together, is the way that we kind of see the world is a way for us to um, create something that represents us, not that we came from that. So, yeah, that's why I like to look at a lot of things through the terms of, okay, how does it look How does it look in a computer? Because someone else has already gone out there and said, hey, this is how humans operate. Let me just put this in a way that's a little bit more objective that can be communicated a bit easier, that you can see the actual outcome of the way it works. So with that said, yeah, the way I see it is imagine you've got code or an application or something that runs, works perfectly fine, and then you change or think about just the programming language. If you change any single one of the keywords in a programming language, that's going to most likely break your entire system. There's like there's no way around that. So for us to think that, okay, we've got this language system built up, for us to think, okay, we can just change any individual word and that's going to make, make everything still going to operate fine. Yes, because there's if you look at a computer system, there's only usually, or a computer programming language, there's only usually what less than 100 keywords. So it's going to have more of an impact Whereas in language, there's like thousands of words, probably more possibly. So if you change one of them, you're probably not going to notice it straight away. But if you start changing a lot more or if you let a lot of time pass, you will start to see the effect of that single change. And if everyone's not operating on this new updated version, language 2.0, 3.0, whatever you're up to, then you're going to get conflicts where someone's going to say something or someone's going to write something down and, and the way that they're using a word or the the understanding they have of what a word actually means is actually completely different to how someone else is operating. And that's going to have consequences that are unforeseeable. Like we can't even imagine at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's very true. I mean, even just thinking about programming languages and you have different languages that have, uh, I can see like <clears throat> we have cultural languages, like different, you know, you speak uh, Mandarin, you, you speak German or you speak English, and then you have different programming languages 
And there are some cultural aspects of those languages that once you learn that language, you start to understand some of the cultural meanings about why they they use certain keywords or, or set up the system in a certain way. So, and I would agree, like, <clears throat> you know, all these languages are a result of how we uh, in, in basically uh, live in the world and interpret the world and how we see the world being shaped and that, and that, that uh, perspective's been built within computers. That's why they're set up in a, in a way that's understandable to us, I guess. Hmm. Language is, it's a foundational element to what we do. Our ability to accurately communicate between one another is what allows us to do complicated things together. Like if it was just a single individual doing whatever they want, they don't really need a language. They understand it internally. There is probably a language going on in their mind, but that's not one that you can really readily communicate to other people. But anytime you want to do something where you are working with someone else, you need to use some kind of language, some way to communicate. So it is the foundation for, I don't know, a company, let's say. When we start to, or you want the foundation to be solid, you want it to kind of be set, you don't want it to really change. Imagine creating a building and then like this is your foundation and then everything is stacked on top. So any change you make to the foundation is going to affect all those other levels. So that's why I'm, I'm cautious. This is one of those things where, and I think of it in terms of um, like money as well. You kind of want it to be, the dynamics of it to be set, to be stable. You want to be able to rely on it in uh, have to have certain properties that don't change, that are immutable. Now language itself, it does change over time. Like Culturally, we see that happen, the, the changing of words, the changing of the way we spell things, which is generally okay because it happens slowly and slightly. But once you start increasing that pace, it's like you're changing out the foundation and you don't know what effect that's going to have. So like at any point, the whole rest of everything can crumble. So that's why when I see it and when I see people starting to mess with that, I'm like, you're messing with something that is at the bottom level is layer one for a whole bunch of other things. You want to be very careful. Like again, computing analogy, it's like the OS. Everything is built on top of the OS. If you change something in the OS, that could destroy everything on top of it. Where if, whereas if you got like a word processing app and you change something that it doesn't really matter, it's not affecting everything else. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think human language is really interesting because, you know, I think what we try to do with it is not only communicate uh, certain aspects, but there's, we're communicating experience and that experience is built up from all our senses about how we perceive and how we uh, interact with things and all the rest of it. So like if you think of colour, that's a that's a really interesting way of showing how language can get a little bit messy and, and why we try to have some consensus around terminology in order for us to get the best outcome. So like you can imagine if I say this is orange over here and then uh, you, you agree it's orange and we call it orange – what does it actually mean? Is it, you know, it's just a consensus between a group of people that that terminology means something and that simplifies us sharing uh, <clears throat> each other's stories, experience, mindset or, or I don't know, information that we each, each hold. And I think you're right. I think <clears throat> as we evolve as humans, language will naturally change because evolution of our environment, evolution of how we live, evolution of just human beings themselves are going to change. So the way we describe things are going to change. I think the problem will occur is like you said, at the pace in which that, that change occurs. So, and also the process that, um, that, that change undertakes. So whether, uh, a change in a certain definition is agreed upon at a, at a high level of consensus, or is it a small portion of people that make that change? And then that infiltrates everyone else. Um, so I think they're, they're all probably important to take note of um, and I would say that the quicker you, let's say, put it this way, the, the value of using language is for us to, as best as we can, accurately convey information between ourselves. The rationale to evolve that language is to improve the way in which we communicate but then the, the rate of change um, is an important factor because people need to upgrade themselves. I mean, you know, you don't want to have a situation where the language changing so quickly that, that a whole group or a whole society is unable to 
be on par on consensus about certain terminology and you leave a good portion of that population behind, you're going to get segmentation in that that social structure because there's going to be portions of people that are unable to communicate properly to other people because the language has changed so quickly that they're updating. So I think a really good uh, case example of this, it's not necessarily language, but maybe a challenge that I think we've had to see firsthand that probably has happened, uh, is probably been unique in, in human history is that over the last couple of years, as we've dealt with COVID, the rules have changed so quickly and everyone had to keep up to date with those rules. So it was incumbent on people to actually uh, check the information, make sure they adhere to the rules and then uh, uh, apply whatever they needed to do based on that. Now, the rate that that changed was quite challenging for some. So some of these rules, uh, I'm talking particularly in, in Victoria and Australia. I just, I just, sorry to butt in here. I want to make it clear and because this is something that I'm really passionate about. It wasn't just for some. This was a big impact for a lot of people. When you change something so radically, you know, people are people are perf- performing actions or, or making choices on the assumption that something will last a long period of time or at least if it gets changed, they will have an ability to adapt to it, like have enough time to adapt to it. But that wasn't the case. Like it was changed so much faster than it ever should have been that that caused a lot of issues and, yeah. Yeah, so I just yeah. wanted to make it a bit more intense because you were kind of like brushing over it in the way I was interpreting it. But that may have been a miscommunication. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they were happening at a rate. And I do remember a particular a weekend that actually it, it stood out as as a big issue in that uh, I think there was, a, uh, there was like a, a, a lockdown order and that lockdown order happened within a four-hour period. Now... For, for for me, I think at that point in time, I didn't know about that until after that period had ended. Lucky for me, I wasn't doing anything that was outside those regulations. And I'm sure there might have been a little bit of grace, but I think highlighting the change and the way that change happened, how quickly that change happened is similar. You could see similar um, situations occurring in language. So, you know, this order was given and then four hours later it was enacted now, we're in a world where we're all connected to mobile phones and the internet and all the rest of it. And so it was almost an expectation that the information could be consumed at that rate. But I think that there's a lot of uh, issues with that. Not only for me, okay, yes, I'm on a mobile phone, that might be handy, but imagine the elderly, imagine people that have still got a flip phone that might not be connected to the internet or don't have the internet at their home or, or whatever. Then in a situation where they're being isolated, how do they then keep up to date? So... I guess I'm trying to draw out a, a, a situation, a, an example of where when we change things at a rapid pace, what impact that has on a mass society and um, and the challenges associated around that. I mean, legally people could have been, people were running businesses that would have to close down their, their events on that, in, on that day and there could be situations where legally they were not aware uh, you know, from their point of view, they were not aware of the change and legally someone could have came in after the change was right after the change and enacted, they could be fined. And so I sort of see that that rate of change with language is a similar thing. We need to ensure that that rate is at a, at a steady pace that is it, at an acceptable rate that people can keep up to date as you go forward so that we're not in a situation where we're just becoming a, a, a complete miscommunication mess, I guess. Yeah, well said. I want to stick with that legal aspect or looking at it from that perspective. Yeah, there's a there's an example where it wasn't necessarily the language that was changing, it was something else that was changing, but it was changing in a legal sense and it was changing at a rapid play, pace, which would catch a lot of people out. And yeah, there's that expectation that, okay, now everyone has to be... Um, what do you mean? Looking at social media all the time or looking at their news feeds all the time. Like, what was it? Four hours, pretty much you said. Within four hours, everyone had to be following some kind of uh, mandate. And yeah, that expectation that, okay, every four hours, someone, everyone has to check their phones or check the news or check, like, you can't build a society around that. You, you try, When you're trying to do something a little bit more involved, when you're trying to do something that takes a long more time, you got to have times where you can put your focus on that and not have to worry about anything else, but to force everyone to always be paying attention. Like 
won't get anywhere. But going back to the legal sense, imagine this. Imagine there's a law in place that has specific wording and then now, okay, we've changed the meaning of one of those words now. It's like, well, am I following that law or not? You have to then, okay, this is the law and then when we stamp this law, this was the language version we were using at that time and now you have to be familiar with every single language version. It's not like you just have to keep up to date. It's like, okay, as a lawyer, as a judge, as anyone working in the legal system, you now have to keep track of every single different language version and make sure you understand which one applies to which laws. Yeah, I agree. And I think we saw something uh, sort of somewhat happen when we saw the Canadian protest, the freedom protest, and they enacted the, I think it was, I can't, I can't remember what they called their emergency orders were, but basically they set these emergency orders in place. And the terminology in the words used, I mean, that that the, the definition of that order was described back in, I think, the 80s, and it was enacted in the modern era 40 years later. And the, some of the loose definitions around the legal wording of that left gaps that allow that to be enacted in in a in a situation that may have not necessarily been intended to be used that way so you're right i mean there's there's you know words are, have significant legal consequences in a lot of cases and and i'm sure <laughs> it'd be great to hear lawyers point of view from this of, about how hard it is to actually manage the changes of definitions over time and and what it means when you have regulations or laws built in an era that it, it that hasn't kept up to the 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 time period in which they're applied, um, so yeah, there's 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 a, there's a really good example of where language has a significant impact on on individuals and societies. Mm. The whole legal system, like you can understand why there's so much fuzziness around it. Why why maybe it does necessitate so much um, so much uh, going to court, like having lawyers, having this because this the language that we use to say that this is what's acceptable, this is what isn't acceptable is so fuzzy that you do need that to work it out. And, and you know, who's to say, I mean, they probably don't always get it right. We, we probably don't as a society always get it right, but it almost makes me think, is there a better way to do uh, laws and legal? Is there a more objective language that you could use that puts more harder definitions on what things are? Yeah, or at least a review process. I think that's one thing that I feel that it is a big gap. You know, you pass laws and the review process is very uh, lacklustre. I mean, I'm sure there's some review processes in place, but I don't think the focus is uh, – uh, there's not enough focus on those areas to make sure that, okay, we enacted every, – every, you know, really strong frame – legal framework that has been applied should be reviewed, you know, every five or 10 years or, or I don't know what the process would be, but I think the review process should be there. And I think another thing to kind of highlight out of these changes, I think going back to that where, you know, where we had to keep changing and, and um, changing the environment and the rules in which we lived in throughout those periods of, um, of the COVID pandemic, like you said, it's, how do you, how do you have a, a, a society that actually has to function by uh, planning for the future? And what what waste you know at this point in time when we are uh, focused on the amount of energy we use and try and sustain the energy levels on a global level about how we how we go about that, how much those changes actually cost a lot of energy. So you know a business sets I think in our case there was QR codes applied everywhere. Uh, for people to tr track and trace, but that period of time sort of lasted, I think, legally for three or four months, and that whole that whole process then changed. So it would be interesting to see how much energy was actually used to develop that system, to push that system out, to have everyone actually then put all the markers out, apply it, and all the rest of it. And was that energy cost worth it? And and then as you change, keep changing those situations, the it's like a it's like inertia, you know. You're going in one direction, and then a change occurs, and you have to then have a significant amount of energy to then change a different direction again. And then the amount of energy that you use through those changes is not trivial. I think at times. Yeah, that's a really good point. That any change incurs a massive like penalty in terms of the amount of energy it takes to navigate from one course to another course. So doing that in rapid succession that is not good for anyone or anything like especially people who talk about you know climate change and are really worried about that thinking about all the different changes that they make and just even 
again, sticking with COVID and maybe we're getting a bit too political, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to more language a bit. But even think about like masks, how effective they are versus how much energy and waste is, is in making them is in, we just throw them out. Like there, yes, there's, there's always a trade off, you know, what is the value of something versus what, how much energy does it take to produce? And this is actually something I was thinking about today. We, I think we approach energy in the wrong way in that if something is, takes a lot of energy, absolutely. Like you can quantify it in, I don't know what kilojoules, carbon emission, whatever your units are. We tend to look at things in an absolute way but we don't look at the actual value that it's producing. Like, is a car good? Should we all be driving cars? You know, they probably waste a lot of energy. They probably create a lot of emissions, but we still use them because the value way outweighs the cost of the energy. So I think that we don't really do that calculation on a lot of things, especially things that don't directly affect us. If it's something like a car, we can feel the value in ourselves. But if it's something like, I don't know, trucks and, and transportation and that and them having to switch over to a new energy source we don't feel that oh, actually the amount of value that they're producing is probably better if we just leave them like that and slowly move to something else or move to something better so and it works in the inverse as well we can have something that takes very little energy but there's even less value so the energy that we're using on it is kind of wasted yeah correct correct and so <clears throat> really i mean it's I guess it always comes back to these kind of questions, but really it's like, okay, a change, if a change needs to occur, that's, that's fine. But why does the change need to go at, occur and what are the consequences? And I don't think that, um, I think we're, we're often impatient in order to try and answer those questions. It's like, oh, that's too hard to answer. We're just going to enact it. You know, we're going to do this now. We're going to enact this now or, or however it is. I mean, I hate, hate to harp on the COVID thing, but I think it's a really good example in some points. Like uh, I think at some point it was, you know, ventilation systems being installed all throughout businesses and, you know, you know, I don't know if it was hospital grade ventilation or whatever it was. But, you know, just really thinking about the, the, the cost benefit trade-offs for that and not just going with an emotional reaction and sort of saying, okay, we see this is the one big problem. Let's just, we can do it. We can fix it. Let's just fix it straight away without actually going, okay, what does the fix actually cost us? Is there value in that? What's the trade-offs? What are the other alternatives? You know, often it's not like the first answer is, is the right answer. I think we have found that a little bit with masks. You know, the first instance was to use them. The next instance it wasn't, it was that they, they didn't provide much protection. And, you know, I, I still don't know where that exactly stands, but <clears throat> You know, having changes, changes, natural change is good, but uh, change needs to be reviewed and needs to go through a process. And, you know, we need to understand the why and the value and the, and the trade-offs for it. Yeah, the other thing is, I mean, I will get off of this in a moment. But the other thing is, yeah, adding all those things, it was treat, also treating a symptom instead of the root cause. How many times do we just try and we, because something is so intense, we're like, we have to address this first but we don't actually recognize that no, that's just the symptom of something else. And you can put all your energy trying to fix that symptom, but it's always going to come back unless you treat the root cause. And yeah, how many times do we actually look and see what is the root cause of this? How far back can we take it and then fix that? And then the knock-on effects from that will actually fix this. And we will have to spend less energy. We'll, we'll gain more from doing that. Like there's just so much involved that we just, like you said, this is the first answer. Yep, that's good enough. It'll fix what we want. No, no need to think any further than that. Yeah, and what level of consensus do we have too? So like, you know, how big is that? I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of having professionals uh, basically help figure out the options and, and, and provide recommendations and, and suggestions and all the rest of it. But there also needs to be a level of consensus amongst the community if, if a change is significant enough that, that everyone uh, has a chance to determine the value risk proposition for them and... Um, I mean, we're probably getting a little bit off track, but I think language, you know, changing language um, has a lot of these uh, similar issues, you know. Let's try and get us back on track. Could continue with that, but uh, I think it's better to get back to the topic at hand. You said something earlier, which I think was a really good example about colour in that how do we know... Like we, we, we know that we are referring to the same thing because we can point to it and say that is the color, that is the color orange, like you said. But we don't know that what we're experiencing is the same thing. And that is kind of irrelevant 
what's what's important about that and this is where it comes back to the content of the message itself is actually irrelevant it's that we understand what the other person is intending with it and so that's why i want to say like any language it's just we are assigning meaning to symbols actually i think the definition i've got it here i'm going to read the definition a systematic means of communicating ideas or feelings by the use of conventionalized signs sound gestures or marks having understood meaning so they've used signs, sounds, gestures, or marks. I'm, I'm saying symbols, which could be something pictorial. It could be like hand gestures, whatever. It's just symbolic of having some meaning. And that's why when people talk about, okay, let's change the definition of words. It's like words. They Those symbols already have meaning attached to them. Why are we trying to change what that meaning is? If you want, if you if, if it's lacking somewhere, why not add another symbol? Why not, you know? When, when we're doing this in programming languages, we'll say, okay, this is obsolete. Don't use this anymore. This is the new thing to use. We'll mark it as this is obsolete. And that's fair enough. I think that's a good way to go about it. You can say these words are no longer to be used because they they don't, they no longer apply in our environment, but we won't override them because in if we go back historically, we have to know what they mean or it's a lot more convenient to know what they mean. So over time, those words may get phased out. I'm sure if we look at like a Shakespearean literature, we'll see that there's a lot of words in there that's like, I don't know what that means. And that's perfectly fine because we've got other words that that, that communicate similar or the same thing, but they're updated. So how do you feel about that? Instead of changing the definition of words, how about we make them obsolete and replace them with something else? Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's interesting and I probably haven't thought this enough through. My initial instinct is, yes, sometimes to add another word and sometimes maybe a word needs to be updated as well. But I will say this, you made actually a really good point that I hadn't actually thought about too. So we know, you know, from historians, I guess historians basically look at uh, whatever communication mediums that people used in the past and they need some kind of standard applied to that so that they can make interpretations about uh, the the civilization of that particular era. And I guess by changing terminologies too quickly, then it makes it very difficult. I can imagine an era where terminology changed rapidly over, say, 20 years, that would make it very difficult for a historian to look back at that point in time and, and discern certain uh, aspects about that, that civilization at that point in time. So I think changing terminology of particular words is is a is a very I think it's a very uh, risky uh, I don't know lack of a better word at the moment but risky business so the immediate one that comes to mind in 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 the current era at the moment I think is gender I think gender is an interesting topic at the moment that we're seeing um, having some troubles around definition. And I think some of those definitions around the traditional use of male and females and what it actually means. So there's a, you know, uh, from my understanding, the words in my mind mean that basically there's a biological makeup of that body and the biological makeup of a male and a female is differently and can be described through biology, regardless of how that individual uh, uh, perceives their own gender. And I think in that case, in my mind, yes, I would... I would say leaving the word male and female the way it is um, would be very important historically and for going forward as well and then making new terminologies to fill in the void for where we lack the language to describe how other people feel about themselves and how they relate to that gender which they're biologically given. Um, just just uh, sorry to, before you continue that, just with the sex and gender part, yeah, that, it was very confusing for me as well until I read in a book, um, I can't remember what the book was exactly, but what they mean, like what the actual terms mean. So sex itself is the objective, okay, look at your chromosomes, this is what makes you male or female. Whereas gender is like, okay, this is how you express, this is how other people see you, which suggests that you are either male or female, but it's not necessarily that way. So that that's the subjective one. Gender itself is subjective. It has nothing to do with your chromosomes or your DNA. It's it's okay just how you express yourself and it's it's suggestive of okay it, again it's a statistics thing it's like okay 90 80 percent of people who wear skirts are women fair enough we're going to assume most of the time that if you wear a skirt you're a woman whereas sex is okay we get we got to look at your dna to determine 
specifically if you are woman or male. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's interesting. I never knew that gender was a sort of a, a way in which you can describe or oh. how did you put it? Say it again, the difference between the two. So sex is obviously describing the biological makeup and you have the category of male and female only in sex then? No, you have it in both, but to say that something is of a – that, that uh, I think you have it on both. Gender is – associated with how you express yourself and so you may have 80 percent of people who are sex female but the way they express themselves gender may be like different it may be more associated with how a male would normally express themselves yeah so let me reword what i actually meant so sex only has two categories a male and a female category because biologically there's only two sexes is that right yep and so they describe both of those. This is interesting to me because I think this actually shows how language can be confusing. Um, so sex can only, from what we understand at the moment, it can only have the two categories and they and those uh, the sex determines the biological, describes the biological makeup and uses the male and female category to describe that biological makeup. When you go to gender, it's how someone expresses themselves. But you can also still use the male and female category in that. So now that becomes, to me, that's not fully resolved language then because you're using the same category but you're applying a different precursor, uh, precursor definition, either sex or gender, and changing the definition of category by that precursor. So if I say in gender, I say I'm male, I don't have to be biologically male. But if I say sex and I'm male, I have to be biological male. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's right. Like it may be wrong, but if like it, it shows how muddy it is, like it's so difficult to to uh, to explain it. Yeah, but that's that's a good case where it's like, okay, you want to change the language around that? Okay, male and female specifically refers to sex, and then you can use a whole bunch of different ones that refer to gender, which is what I think people are trying to do, but they're also um what do you call it? They're also wrapping up sex into that. They're saying you know, if you are, what is it, like all those different letters of the rainbow, whatever it is, if you are one of those, it also tells something about your sex, which it doesn't. Does that make sense? Maybe reword that just to make sure because it's a touchy Yeah, no, issue. no, say that again, actually. Yeah, just say that again so that's a bit clearer in my mind. So people, oh, I'm not putting this on people, I'm just, I'll, it's capable for people to say that they are a certain gender that, maybe doesn't we don't necessarily use like you said male and female is typical but maybe there's other ones that other people want to use that's okay but when they say that that tells you what their sex is what their dna says that's when it's like no it doesn't yes so to me i mean if what we're looking at is is true the language is unresolved in my mind because there's no the the word uh male and female can mean two different meanings then. and how do I then <laughs> how do I then navigate any uh, any conversation by understanding that and I will say what's what's interesting about this is it seems to this this topic and it uh, we might have people screaming at us now for instance most likely yeah, yeah. <laughs> this topic actually has a significant emotional response attached to it for for probably quite a few reasons and it shows how important language actually is then uh, because if you're getting an emotional response based on just these v cues, these verbal communication cues, um, it means there's something unresolved about the situation in my mind. And to me, if this is the case, the quickest way to resolve this, which is interesting, but is to not use male and female in gender because – and to just use it as the sex and then gender, I guess, I don't know what you would replace in gender to do that, but it seems like in sex it can't be fluid and in gender it can be fluid and therefore that's definitely open for misinterpretation in so many different ways. Um, yeah. And language is unresolved. I think looking at it from like a purely logical, technical perspective, yeah, I would say that the easiest route here would be, okay, you don't use male and female to refer to gender at all. You can say that this this attribute suggests that the sex is male or this is suggested, but you wouldn't use it to refer to uh, gender. 
But one thing I want to come back to is like you said, yeah, it does have this language and, and, and other language has emotional um, responses or reactions, I'd call them actually, that uh, to, to people. You say a word and they'll get, it'll bring out some emotion in them. And it always strikes me as funny, like when I think about it, it's like, what are you actually getting mad at? You're getting mad at air, at hair in your ears that is like vibrating back and forth based on air pressure, based on someone else vibrating, you know. I don't know, I, I, my, my knowledge just stops here, but like vibrating their throat to make that air pressure change. Like it's just, you're, you're getting angry at waves pretty much when you look at it. So at that point is when, 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 I, when I find myself getting wrapped up in emotion because someone said something, I try and remember that. I'm like, what are you actually getting upset at here? Yeah, I think generally in those cases, it's there's an underlying unresolved conflict within that individual that they haven't come to peace at with uh you know maybe it is that then misunderstand you know the in this case i think probably in the gender cases a lot of the time is that they've they have been brought up in a world that misunderstands them as as an individual and they don't quite fit in and i guess that emotion is driven from that rather than the actual terminology that's being used and i guess those symbols are the cues in which triggers that emotion so i mean in these situations, I think this is what we need probably as a society we need to do better is that and um, it, it is to slow down and to really make sure you understand what that other person is actually saying and that is to give them the space to maybe uh, use the wrong language at certain points in time or that you perceive the wrong language is being used and just maybe stand back for a second and don't rely on the definition of the terminology and maybe have a, a deeper conversation with the individual to find out exactly what their interpretation of the language which they use. Because, I mean, simply in that case, you could, like you said, you you know, we're all human. We make assumptions of people when you first meet them. And one of those assumptions is, is definitely, uh, I'm going to try and use the right terms here, is definitely sex. And so automatically you would perceive someone as, as uh, maybe male or female. And I can see easy situations where individuals might refer to someone by uh, maybe in what an individual is considering themselves as a particular gender and the another individual that doesn't know them uses the wrong terminology and calls them maybe a male or female when they might identify as a, as a different gender. And I don't think the first response in that instance is to be upset with the individual that, that, uh, that maybe labelled them as male and female. And maybe just either try and educate them from your perspective or at least try to understand a little bit about what they meant by that because, you know, I would be definitely mistaken a lot of the time by referring to someone's sex as, as who they are and, and I have no problem. Whatever gender you want to describe yourself, that's fine. But um, I shouldn't be sort of uh, crucified for saying the wrong thing at at a wrong point in time just because of the confusion we've actually just i think highlighted i think that's a very good point and something that we would all benefit from keeping in mind is to just give people start off by giving them the benefit of the doubt okay this what they've said rubs me the wrong way first off is am i am i understanding what they're saying correctly because i think I'm going to put a number like 80% of the issues that we have between people is just because of miscommunication. We've misunderstood what someone else has said and then we've taken offense to it or we've seen it in a different light. And instead of stopping and thinking about, okay, I disagree with someone here. Let me just make sure that I'm actually understanding what they say first before I try and uh, refute what they say or argue with what they say. We just go straight back into, okay, we need to argue it. And then the other person does the same thing and it just ratchets up until it gets like too hot to handle. <laughs> and yeah, so something we could do, which is going back to computers, is a lot of the time if you need good quality communication, you send back an acknowledgement that you've understood, that you've received that bit of information. And so in spoken languages, why can't we do the same thing? It's like, okay, you've said something. Let me just send back an acknowledgement that I understand what you're talking about. And this is one of the things that a lot of people that will teach you how to communicate uh, better is to, okay, you hear what someone else has said, now repeat it back to them in your own words so that they understand that you're, you've heard it correctly. And then in that way, if you say something and I'm like, hang on, that doesn't sound quite right, then I can correct that and make sure that what the, the message that is getting between us is, is, is accurate 
And then at that point, if we have a disagreement, okay, now we can argue, we can disagree about things. But it should always be that first thing is to make sure that that communication is as accurate as possible. Yeah, agree. agree. I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of, as you probably well know, of always trying to basically say back something that someone said to me that's maybe difficult to understand, like, or at least a little bit complex, I guess. And you're just basically checking, am I seeing it the same way as them? And if not, where where is the difference? And then narrowing down on that. And I think the earlier, the earlier you can do in the conversation, the better, because, you know, going back to that gender thing, if you didn't look at oh, what I'm meaning by saying male or female is biological, if you didn't start off at that point, you can actually end up having an argument that's completely off on a tangent and you haven't actually resolved the root the root cause of the issue, the misunderstanding. So you can imagine, you know, they start talking about gender and not being accepting of different genders and all the rest. And yes, I am. And there can be a lot of confusion about that just because of base fundamental difference between how they are interpreting a particular word, I guess. So the quicker you can actually do that. So as soon, in my mind, as soon as you disagree on something, that's when you want to, all right, we disagree. Whereabouts is it that we disagree? Let's walk back. Don't get angry. Be calm and start to ask, do you mean this by this? Or, okay, if you don't mean that, please give me, you know, explain what you do mean by it. Because uh, we can't just assume that everyone has the same interpretation of all these meanings. I don't know what a dictionary, the amount of words in a dictionary would be um, just in English. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it would be in the order of maybe a million words or something. Um, so I wouldn't go that high, but yeah, thousands, tens of thousands, possibly, yeah, tens of thousands. But um, but either way, I think to have a conversation with the assumption that each of those words that you use in that conversation is interpreted in the same way you did with the other person is just asking for, for trouble, asking for, for problems. So as soon as there's something that you don't agree upon or that you that doesn't quite align to you, then it's incumbent to you the first thing you should do is question, is to ask, is to open up a dialogue. Yeah, especially... Uh Again, very good point and uh, I should repeat back to you what you said so that we know that we understand each other. But I'm sure from the way I follow on from it, you'll be able to detect if I've caught what you're throwing out. Especially going back to there's however many thousands of words, possibly millions, you may be right there. Remembering that majority of the words are abstract. We have a kind of an idea, a feeling about what they mean, but there's nothing we can objectively point to and say that's what that word means. Like for an example... I was thinking about this earlier. How do I how do I get this point across? For an example, I want you to explain to me objectively what an example what example means. <laughs> Without using the word example, yeah, it's it's. I can't think on the fly of something to be able to do that. Yeah. You could give me examples of things, but that isn't actually explaining what the word example means. What happens is I'm formulating an idea about what the word example means by the various instantiations of that word that you've created but that in itself is not you can never point to it and say that is what example is yeah i really like that word instantiation and i guess it, we use it because of programming but um for, from a simpleton term it means that you've actually used the term in ver, in different in different paraphrases let's say or, or paragraphs or communication you've used that term in in different ways as you've talked through many different conversations and what someone does is try to generalise what that meaning is across all its uses. And so you start to narrow down a definition. Actually, in, in fact, I think this is how people do learn language. If you look at a kid, that's what it's doing. It's looking at all the ways in which that, that, that vocal, uh, that, that audio symbol or however you want to describe it, that, that uh, noise is being used and the corresponding actions around that, and then it's generalising what that term actually means. And sooner or later, like mummy, oh, everyone calls that visual person over there, that visual person, they all say mum, they use that, that, that audio signal. So that must be mum. So I must have to say that and then everyone knows what I mean. So you're right. Every time we use a term, it... Uh, you're basically using each time it's being used to generalize what, what its meaning actually is. 100%. I, th I think that is how we learn. I mean, that's how I perceive it. And 
from what I've heard other people say, I think it's they see it the similar way, where it's you're seeing various examples of what that word actually means. And from each example, you're seeing what is similar between them and you're saying that is what the word is, what is similar across all these different instances of of this word, that is what it is. So yeah, like when you say mummy, it's 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 a feeling even that you get from this person. It's not even necessarily something objective that we can say they have certain look, they whatever. It could be just a feeling that you get when you're around them. It's a feeling, it's a smell, it's a whatever we can sense, whatever we sense about an environment that all uh, that all forms how we understand a word. Yeah, and it, and it goes, it shows how cultural differences become a a challenge like so one of the things is uh, i spent about three months in texas and i realized certain terminology was not applied the same way and um and that was just a cultural difference so the general like you said the generalization of how that term is being used so a a couple of ones that i do remember is like i went into a shop to uh, i I saw like a um a, a vegan pie and so I ordered it thinking it was like a, an actual, you know, in Australia what we call like a, a meat pie, like a, a, a baked pie. But in their case it was actually a, a pizza. And so I ended up getting a pizza and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I <laughs> got that. Uh, chips was another one. So if I asked for chips in Australia, that can mean hot chips as well. In America it's basically always used for the cold crisps, you know, the, in a packet and chips are called fries or um, uh uh, what was another one? I, I think those terms there, they're, they're general. I, I don't know what chip says in, in the dictionary. It's just something culturally. Uh, oh, toilet. And uh, they, they use something else. Bathroom. I think. Bathroom or water closet maybe. There's, something, there's some other term. I think it's water closet. I can't remember now. But, but it's interesting when you say certain things um, that you're used to in your culture and it can be using the same language, which is English, and you apply it in a different culture, how the generalization of that term has has changed somewhat its meaning to the local environment, I guess. And so, yeah, I mean, I've made mistakes by thinking I'm using the right terminology. Um, and in my culture, it would have been completely fine, but in another culture, it wouldn't be. So, you know, slang and, and all these other, uh, other things are built from that. That's a really good pickup that even using the same symbols, which would be the same word, in various locations, in various cultures, there we've ascribed different meanings to them because the way we formulated our understanding of what they are is through experiences that differ widely depending on where you are and what culture you're in. So, yeah, that was a really good pickup and <laughs> I like that you made that addition. Uh, is there anything, I'll throw it over to you, is there anything that you wanted to bring up, anything language that we haven't covered that you can think that you want to talk about? Uh, no, not at all. Um all I would say is I think uh, personally for me it has been – when I grew up it was a challenging thing. I had a lot of trouble with exams because of language because I was never able to ask exactly what they mean. And I think for me my mind maybe is quite open so I don't clo- – I, I, you know, sometimes it makes it hard for me to close down on, on, on something. So I think, yeah, just, just taking a pause and trying to understand what the person that's – that's talking to you or writing to you or whatever form of communication is, um, basically pause and really just think about and, and maybe try and probe them and ask them before before you make any assumptions, I guess. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, once again, I think the biggest thing that I've learned when, when communicating with people is just make sure you are on the same page that you understand what they're trying to say. Because, and, and it, it may make me boring it sometimes because, you know, it is fun sometimes to have that argument and then to realize at the end, the reason you're arguing in the first place is because you misunderstood the first thing that the person said. And then, yeah, you do that. There are fun times, like as long as you have that ability to just keep it, you know, oh, this is just, uh, we're, we're having a bit of fun, a bit of a disagreement here. But a lot of the times it is difficult to maintain that, especially if you don't have a close relationship with the person that you're disagreeing with. So yeah, that's something I like to keep in mind that if, if again, if, if you feel like, something feels off here or I'm getting heated about something, just slow down and make sure that you're actually understanding what the other person is saying. Yeah. And then I guess one last thing I will say is words and uh, can be hurtful, but it's not violent. So give people space, give people space to express themselves. It is hard to express ourselves as individuals, some harder than others. And so just, I think it's always good to just, you know, realize that words can hurt, but they don't, 
you know, you know, in most cases they won't they won't harm people, like kill people. And so just to give people space to try and express themselves and make failures in 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 the way in which they do. Mm. One thing I was thinking about actually on the way over here was so languages where we're talking specifically about uh, I don't even I don't even know what you would term it, what you would term this type of language where it's like words or written symbols, but languages could be anything. It could be code, it could be mathematics, it could be pieces of art, it could be dance, it could be, I don't know, I had a list there, but I can't find it. Lang there's many different ways of languages and, and all that language is trying to do is to allow us to express something. If you take it all the way back to its root, it's to express a feeling. And so spoken language is just another way to express a feeling and it's each language has its own benefits and detriments. There's certain things that you can present through, say, music that you could never present through art. I mean, not, not art, um, through words. There's just, there isn't that capacity to share that feeling or that aspect of a feeling through words. And so one thing that I was dismissing when I was younger, I mean, I've got better at it now and I, I focus on it a lot more. When I was younger, I, I could understand i could see visually in my mind how to do something i could understand logically how to do it how to do it mathematically but then to turn it into words to explain to someone else i thought it's a waste why i'll just draw them a picture i'll just write a program i'll just show them a mathematical equation it'll explain exactly what i'm trying to say but even there i was dismissing the fact that spoken written language like english like any german like why am i struggling <laughs> there's there's hundreds of languages out there like greek or like macedonian like Irish, whatever, doesn't matter what it is. They all have this, and maybe even even knowing multiple spoken languages is better because there's certain aspects that you can communicate in those languages that you can't in whatever your 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 primary language is. But there there is a benefit to learning how to also put your feelings, communicate, formulate into words what it is you you feel, you think. It's it's another way to learn. For yourself like i i do writing and i have a lot of ideas and, and when putting them into writing allows me to kind of put them into formation and go ah, okay that's how they all connect to see it as a picture whereas i used to just do that through mathematics through drawing diagrams and stuff you can actually do that as well through a spoken language like english so i don't know that's just a point i want to put out there it, there is a lot of benefits beyond even just communicating with someone else there's also benefits to yourself in understanding your feelings and communicating them and yeah so. yeah I, I agree with that like yeah uh being able to write things down allows you to think through your thoughts um yeah so each medium has its advantages and disadvantages there's a plenty you know a lot of people oh just you know visual is a much better language um but yeah there's also visual hacks like you can trick people's minds by you know certain visual tricks that you, you know, the person will perceive something is there and it's not, oh, colour is the way it is, but it's mixed with, it's it's designed in a certain way to trick you. Um, so each, each yeah, format has, uh, or medium has its, has its pros and cons. Um, and, yeah, I do think that written language is a really good way for us to think through our thoughts at a rapid rate, uh, particularly at a rapid rate too, to be able to really go through and, and nut out um, uh, certain problems that you just can't do. It costs too much energy to do otherwise. I just want to bring it back to what I said at the start. Uh, the purpose of language is to accurately communicate a message between multiple parties. Yeah, I want to I want to kind of leave it at that because that's what I kind of want to get across is that, like you were saying, we're, we're all just trying to communicate something that we feel, you know, try not to take it to heart, try not to take offense to it. A lot of the time it is just that we've misunderstood what they're saying. So just see it as, okay, have I understood correctly what their what their perspective is, what their point is? And then if we do that, I think like that will get rid of 80% of our problems that we have. Yeah, definitely. All right, Mick, one last time. Is there anything else before I wrap it? No, nah, I think that's good to close on. All right, well, uh, my supplemental song suggestion for today is Lupe Fiasco's Bitch Bad. My quote for today is, you can't get wet from the word water by Alan Watts. I thought that was kind of fitting for a language topic. All right. Thank you all out there for listening and joining us for this discussion. We'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, be well.